Hi, my name's Linda Brogan, I'm a playwright and before I was ever produced I was the writer in residence here at Contact Theatre and also at the same time on attachment at the National Theatre. When I was a teenager in 1976 I went into this club called the Reno in Moss Side, right? And this is a bit of a sticky question because we prefer to be called half cast you know, like, but, and everybody gets called mixed race now. But when I went into this club, it was kind of like in this kind of like the no zone area of Moss Side. And where I'm from was like the posher bit of Moss Side where everybody owned the houses and washed the doorsteps. So we kind of like gone into this like really dangerous area to buy a weed. So we go downstairs, me and my two mates, right? Because we used to go into kind of like white clubs like Genevieve's where they play. Oh yeah, um, what was out at the time? Dancing Queen was out at the time. So like, so we go to buy a weed off Gang I don't even know why we've started smoking weed, even that's dangerous. We, we're used to drinking martini. And we're used to just being the three of us that are our colour. So we go, the Gang Yu's outside, this like old Jamaican, and um, he's like selling a weed. So we buy a weed and then we look at the door and then we think, oh, you know, like, like let's just go down. So we walk down the stairs and when we go in, there's like wall to wall half cast and we've never seen as many people the same colour as us. And from that night, we didn't leave for about six years. So, yeah. Do you, oh, I've forgotten to go into the project. I'm just remembering what that was like at the time. So 40 years later, I'm going to dig that club up. I'm going to excavate it with Salford Archaeological Department and it's going to be exhibited what we find and the archive online that I'm going to collect over the next 16 weeks are going to be exhibited in Manchester Museum. When I used to, when I first was coming to Contact Theatre and used to sit in, sit in here in the bar when I kind of was writer in residence and thought it was really special and super, they used to, it had a great soundtrack, Contact Theatre. And um, a lot of people was mixed race as well, but a lot younger than me, but mixed race. And I'd sit in the bar and I used to think, I'm even getting upset as I think about it, it reminded me of the Reno, but what it kind of made me think was that we were all artists at that time, but at that time in the 70s, we would never have dared to think we could be artists. So I've kind of like had that in the back of my mind, but I've waited to have enough power to, to do... I, well, I didn't know I wanted to do that, but somehow I wanted to kind of... I wanted to bring the Reno... I want to bring the Reno back to life. And I wanted to give us the opportunity to be artists now, in this day and age, and something that we couldn't be then. Why a lot of mixed race people ended up in the arena? Yeah, why didn't they go? Why didn't they go to white clubs? Why didn't they go to black clubs? Why did they? You know, why did this this thing? Why did it exist? Well, this is one of the questions I'm going to ask in the project because, to be honest, I don't a hundred percent know. I, I I think it's amazing that they did end up there, and I do know a lot of their stories because even though the club was in Moss Side, a lot of the lads who were like, they're like 60 now, they didn't, they didn't actually come from Mossad, they'd come from Ancoats, so, you know, like in surrounding areas, predominantly white areas. So one of the questions I really want to ask them is that, how did you know the Reno existed? And how did you get there and your first nice journey? And that feeling again, like I had when you went down, you know, like, and then there's just like loads of people the same colour as you. I have to put in here that, it was terrible to be our colour when we were kids. You know, like when we were born, it was a terrible thing for a black man and a white woman to be together. You know, I mean, mum used to tell stories about people spat in my pram. And I just thought my mum was being dramatic. Do you know what I mean? But as I've started to like look at this project and then on earth, you know, like different reports from the time, there's like, yeah, like one of them says um, that it's a, from a, a famous 1930s Fletcher, Fletcher report done in Liverpool, and it says, the offspring of interracial relationships are born with mental and physical defects. So it's like a word of warning. But when I started like reading all these things, I started to make sense to me. 
you know that I've been carrying this burden? Like loads of things like that, that I don't know my white cousins. Do you know what I mean? I didn't recognise my mum's sisters at a funeral. When my mum was pregnant with my sisters and my brother, and there used to be like these maternity hospitals and then I've just got like in a picture in my mind, it's like the early 60s, that all the women used to walk round with their stockings rolled down to their ankles, you know, like waiting for their internals and, you know, like prenatal care. And I remember that, so I would be, when my first memories are coming in, I'll be about three or four, and I'd be walking behind my mum, ashamed that my mum was having yet another black baby. So going back to this Reno project that you're doing, you did mention that you're doing an archaeological dig. Um, what other um, parts of the project are going to be involved and in? How can people get involved? Um, the parts that... so. I've started to write now on Huffington Post a blog that leads to, up to um, the 17th of October. And on the 17th of October, a website is going to go live where I'm going to write, like in a straight line, the story of the Reno trap between 1971, its rise, and 1981, its fall. And in 1971, I've called it the rise of the flat jackets. And that's like when, this is before my time, and like the lads are wearing flat jackets because of Bruce Lee and the films that come from that time. And they talk about Buddha, they're looking for God. You know, like they're also thieves and mug everybody. And um, so I'm going to capture their story. Their, so I'm going to write, ask them questions and hopefully they'll lash their individual stories to my story. And then in 1976, then, yeah, the 1976, I'm calling that women's lib. So that's when I went down and, yeah. And it was a time of women's lib as well, of us being more ballsy and that. The 1979, it's the rise of the safari jacket. And that's when younger lads started coming down. So instead of like just being happy with mugging and stuff like that, which it kind of like goes with society's time as well, they started holding places up with shotguns and going out and doing like different types of crime but they weren't crimes to us it was like living in goodfellows you know like our studio 54 and we just loved each other and loved our escapades and things and then they came down one night after their like first big like gig like that and they were all were wearing safari jackets which we took the piss out of and um and then so and then there's 1981, where the Civil War sparked by an affair that a flat jacket had with a safari jacket. And then there's gang war, when one of the safari jackets had an affair with a Cheatham Hill lad, girl. And the all-out gang war was quite horrific, you know. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to tell what I know of that story, including fun times as well and us being a family and that and hopefully they're going to lash their stories to those to to that through spine yeah and then that will um, and i'm hoping for an audience online that will happen online on the website and i'm hoping for people to interact with our story and what gets explained or what gets on earth during our story on the 1st of March, we're going to dig up where the arena was. It's just grassed over at the minute and whatever. So I'm hoping that everyone's like kind of been drawn to our story and we're dead excited about what we will find there. Will there be bits of the dance floor? Will there be bits of the bar left? Because there was a big building on top and it was a cellar club. And we're, I'm, I'm hoping that they've knocked the top building into the cellar and when we excavate it, there'll be bits there. And then during that, we're going to film every moment that happens and turn that into a documentary. Basically, what's prompted you to do this project now, to do the excavation? To yeah. do the archiving of the Reno? And what's the significance of it socially and personally? What do you think this, like, why now, why do this project? It's a huge question, that. It is. Yeah. Um, I'll start from another place, right, about it, is 
A few years ago, I was reading, I've always been addicted to slavery, right? Don't ask me why. But I think it was because that's the only place I could find someone of the same colour as me. So I've always been addicted. When I was a teenager, just before I went to this club, and for a long time I used to read pulp fiction slavery books. They were called, they were set in this like plantation called Falconhurst. The scene is really bad now. And um, like in that, you could be a sexy mulatto, you know, like, so, so I think, that, you know, like things like get trapped in your head, that that's, So about four years ago, I found some authentic slave narratives, right, which I didn't know such a thing existed. So like, I'm like over the moon, you know, like, wow, I can't believe, you know, that they've recorded people's, you know, like true journey at the time. So I'm reading them, reading them, you know, like, and I'm dead happy to be with these people when I'm reading them, you know, like, and like, wow, you know, like you really did live. It's not just roots or it's not just, you know, like a notion and it's not just a terrible thing. So um, about a thousand pages in, right, I read and I keep calling him Jacob D. Green, which I know someone's going to kind of like tell me is wrong. This slave, he apologises for taking a horse, you know, like to escape slavery, right? And for about a week I thought, that's not right. You know, like there's like something not right about that, you know? And even that, that even takes me a week to think it, you know, that that's not right, you know? And then... Mm. The short answer is that there's loads and loads and loads of stories that do not get told by people of colour like me. Do you know, of real stories, like that Jacob D. Green tells us he escapes on a horse, he apologises for stealing a horse because ten chances to one, he can't read or write. So he's telling his story to a missionary, right? And therefore he has to align himself with the missionary's way of telling of wanting to perceive him do you know that's what it's about really it's about perception and i've done that myself in the arts as well i have told the story of my life in the way that i feel i need to be perceived in the arts to be taken seriously and i want to put a stop to that and i feel quite kind of militant about it do you know that i want to tell the story of these people of in the reno of our criminality of how we was there of our good times in our words, do you know what I mean? Like I've been a playwright for 15 years and I could have told this story a long time ago, but I kept kind of like walking away from it and walking around it because of loyalty to what I know that I experienced inside there in the way of camaraderie and the story that I would be expected to tell. Do you know what I mean? Like of our terribleness and oh, you know, like what happened terrible to us and how can we be saved and how can we make the white man look better for giving me the money to do it? Do you know what I mean? Like, and I'm just absolutely against that. I'm against that in the arts in general, you know, and I've, I've felt subjected to that a lot. Do you know, like so, and it's not even that I felt subjected that anybody stood over me. The damage is already in me and the damage is historical. You know, like it's, yeah. And I've been thinking about my things like, you know, like post-traumatic stress disorder and epigenetics. You know, that like, even this is gonna sound so wrong, right? But even like, you know, like people talk about that a lot about the Holocaust, you know, and things like that, that, or that people coming back from Vietnam or coming back from Afghanistan or people who've been beaten up or whatever, that you've got post-traumatic stress. But I think that as a black person and as a mixed race person and as a person of any colour, that we have a type of post-traumatic stress, right? Do you know, that just infiltrates us, do you know, and makes us cow, you, and, and makes us, I'm kind of going back to Jacob D. Green and, and apologising for, for stealing the horse, right? What I thought afterwards was, if that was a white prisoner of war in a Japanese prisoner of war camp during the Second World War, he would have told his story as a hero. You know, like he would have just come back. 
And we never see ourselves as heroes, even if it's a negative hero, even if we were criminals, we were heroes. It was wonderful. I loved that time. I regret nothing about it. Do you know, you know, um, yeah. And it's lashed to a really, really personal story as well, where that I was um, exiled from my own play rehearsal when I questioned a, a white middle-class director. I, I was writing, the play was about two black girls who were made speechless, two real girls who, in 1981, they um, burnt down their school. It was empty, they burnt it down at night. And I, I personally think that they just wanted to be part of the riots, which was up and down the country, but they were stuck in Wales, out on their own, and they were already elect mutes, you know, like because they couldn't assimilate, or that is what we have assumed about them. So I've wrote this play, um, co-wrote co it actually, but did, did most of the work as his kind of like slave and plantation life and that. So we're in the rehearsal and I'm like sat in rehearsal for a week and I'm thinking, I'm sure, right, that the white middle class director is asking the two secondary white characters what they think, right? And I'm sure that she's telling the black actors, the two main character twin black actors, what to think right but also what i'm also sure of is that they are scared to say anything and i also know that i am scared to say anything right so i watch it for a week yeah and there's been loads and loads of other other little things you know that i'm scared of inside of that so i watch it for a week so i go home on saturday and I write an email to the director and I tell her what I think is happening, you know, and I say it in a way that I would like to talk about it. I would like it to be addressed, right? I'm not even, I didn't even know how to say that because I wasn't who I am then. Now I just knew what I was seeing. So that was on the Saturday. On the Sunday, I got a phone call, right? Often his, his, she was hysterical. She's been up all night, right? I've been up all night. You've said that I'm a racist. But two things happened in me, to be honest, right? Part of me felt vindictive and happy that she was in pain. And another part of me was absolutely terrified because the thing that I was most scared of was now happening. You know, that if I ever stand up to these people who are higher than me, I can expect not something good, and here it was, right? So I didn't say anything because I didn't know what to say. So she got like um, her co-artistic director to ring me back, who also accused me of making out, you know, that she was racist and kind of like wanting to calm the situation down, but wanting to calm the situation down in favour of her, not in favour of me, that I was supposed to back down and kind of be sorry and take back. And to be honest, at the time I kept thinking, just back down and be sorry. But when I look back six years ago at what was actually operating in me, do you know what I mean? Like that, that kind of need to back down and that need to be back down, but I didn't. So, but I was terrified. And I mean, as I talk about it, it's like I'm in a tsunami. It felt like I was in a tsunami or something. And it's just like one human being telling another human being what they think they can see and it needs talking about. So I hadn't backed down. So on the Monday, right? Oh no, during the conversation when I haven't backed down, um, the person saying that, well, at least you're not aggressive, classic racism. Do you know what I mean? Like, and that's the thing that they hold over us all the time is that you're not acting in a right way. Do you know what I mean? Like that, you know, like that you're loud and whatever, you know that you're not aggressive. So, so therefore now you have to take every step delicately, you know, so that you don't live their label of you, you know, and are perceived, perceived to be human even with rights. You know, you've now got to play their game, right? 
So, so on the Monday, I got an email and it said that when you go into rehearsal, do, um, you're allowed to talk to the director. Don't talk in rehearsal. You were allowed to talk to the director for 20 minutes at lunchtime when you have made sure she has eaten, right? Think about the language. Think about the way that the language is worded when I have made... So her life is worth more than mine. What about when I've not eaten? You know, like, so... And I'm allowed to talk for 20 minutes when she goes home, before she goes home to her family. So now I'm, like, mad as hell. Do you know what I mean? Like, but I still have to play it to their rules. In my rule, right, in my side, in the Reno, right, you just F and blind, you'd attack each other. It'd be over in 20 minutes. Do you know what I mean? Like, and then you probably become friends for life. But in this kind of, like, this other way of, like, you just pass the pepper grinder in a certain manner. Do you know what I mean? Like, so that they know that, you know that they're not happy with you. Do you know what I mean? So, so I wrote back. I email back, you do realise that this play is called Speechless, right? And you're making the two main characters, the two, char the two real life twins from 1981 speechless if you don't unpack their journey. You're making the two actresses modern day in this time speechless if you don't unpack their journey, right? And you're also making me speechless. You do get the irony, right? That was all I wrote. So I'm sat downstairs thinking, dead smug, dead happy with myself, you know, like I've been witty, I've told her and I'm not scared anymore, right? Two hours later, their producer rings up and says, um, Linda, don't come to rehearsal, right, on Monday. And if you do, don't come to, re yeah, don't come to rehearsal. And if you do, the police will remove you. The best bit about that is, I'm sure if I was blonde, white and middle class, right, the last bit of the sentence would not be added. Do you know, like, so... So, what I should have done was go and let the police remove me or make a stink in the newspaper or do something like that. But what I did was implode. So the Reno project is a direct reaction to that, that I will have my voice, and but this time I will have an army, you know, as well, because I don't trust anybody in the arts, and I don't trust myself within the arts. Do you know what I mean? And I want to have my real voice, like Jacob D. Green, right, had to tell the story in a certain way, of to be sorry to steal a horse to save his life but also he never told the story of any of his family of his mum or his dad of sitting around the pot do you know what i mean our lives is always in relationship to a white life do you know which sounds bad for me to say because my mum is white do you know what i mean but even like 12 years of slavery it is told in relation to a white story. And the most interesting story in 12 Years a Slave is actually the white slave owner who loves the black girl. Do you know what I mean? Like, we're never given an emotional journey that is just, well, even the word given. Why am I saying given? Do you know what I mean? I'm not being given anything. I'm going to take it. Do you know what I mean? And, yeah, yeah. <laughs>